before the president arrives, I wanted to recognize a few people whose names will probably not uh, uh, be called during the ceremonies because of the uh, lack of time here. They may be later on, but anyway, I wanted, uh, I wanted to give a big hand to a person that has meant an awful lot to the Democrats of North Carolina, the true. But we're real excited uh, about this day, and I know there are plenty of people who've been involved here in, in all of this effort, and we appreciate your presence here and coming. There are some of us who's been worried about rain, but I guess you will just have to take the attitude of a person who plays golf, and they swear that it never rains on a golf course, at least while you're playing golf. And uh, if that's the case here, I'm sure it's to be true. When the president arrives, the plane will be parked in this area. He will be greeted by the governor of the state, and a few others, and then we want you to give him a real rousing welcome when he comes down the ramp of that plane. All right, I've been asked to inquire if our next senator from North Carolina, John Ingram, is here. Yeah, here he comes. Let's give him a hand. John Ingram, the next senator from North Carolina. Well, here comes a plane. Uh, looks like it's a little bigger than could land in Hall River, so maybe uh, this is the one we're looking for. It's a beautiful bird, isn't it? big as that thing it was, I didn't think it'd slow down until it got to Weaverville. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. Thank you very much for that rendition of our national anthem. You can always tell when the president's about to arrive because you see the TV boys get busy. I really think Governor Hunt ought to get one of these for the state of North Carolina.
Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We are deeply honored here in Western North Carolina, Mr. President, that this is the site of your first public appearance outside of Washington since the Camp David Summit. We congratulate you upon what promises to be the greatest peacemaking achievement of our time. Certainly you may be assured, Mr. President, that these good God-fearing mountain people are honoring your request that they pray for the continuing success of the Camp David endeavor. It is my happy privilege now to present to you, our friends in Western North Carolina, the first speaker on our program, a great friend of mine who served with me in the North Carolina General Assembly, an outstanding commissioner of insurance, now the candidate of the Democratic Party for the United States Senate, the Honorable John Ingram.
Thank you, Congressman Gudger. Mr. President, Governor Hunt, Senator Morgan, distinguished platform Democrats, distinguished North Carolinians all, I'm proud to be back up here in the mountains again. You know, about a week ago, I talked with Phil Wise in the president's office over at Camp David. And we discussed the postponement of this event to today. And you know, my mom was a great student of St. Paul. And she said that all things work for good for those who love the Lord. And the day is the day that is great not only for the world, but for Western North Carolina and all North Carolinians, because the president is here to bring us good tidings of great joy. The day is such a great day for his leadership that even even our $5 million man has come out with another ad in the newspaper praising him. And I'll tell you what, Mr. President, these, these people here in North Carolina saw that $5 million man ride the coattails of Richard Nixon into the Washington, and they're not going to let him ride anybody else's coattails in. They're ready, they're ready for a people's man who had rather represent the people of North Carolina than the millions of dollars of special interest pouring into this state from out of state, and I need your help. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the North Carolina Congressional Delegation is truly an outstanding group of men and a great team. The quarterback on that team is our Democrat United States Senator. His counsel, advice, and assistance have been of incalculable value to me as a freshman congressman, and I shall always be grateful to him. I honor him and respect him, not only for this, but for the outstanding record he is building as a great statesman, representing a great state in that great body, the United States Senate. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friend and colleague, our United States Senator, Bob Morgan. Thank you, Congressman Gudger. Mr. President, Governor Hunt, distinguished guests, and my fellow North Carolinians, I want to say to our president that it was a privilege to accompany him back to North Carolina, and especially back to Western North Carolina, where he, where he visited us two years ago. And as on, on the way down, I was remembering or thinking of some of the things that he said to us here in Western North Carolina two years ago, he said that if we helped him to become the President of the United States, that he would make us proud again. He has kept his promise. <laughs> Mr. President, when you were here two years ago, you told us that you would do something about unemployment as President of the United States. And my fellow North Carolinians, since he took the office as President, six million new jobs have been created in America. Again, he kept his promise. When he was here two years ago, he told us that he was concerned about deficit spending in America. He talked about balance, uh, balance in the budget. I want to report to you that when the budget is adopted, when the, before this Congress adjourns, that he will have reduced the deficit by nearly 30 percent. And if we do as well in the next two and a half years under his leadership, 
we'll have a balanced budget. And again, our president has kept his promise. And I want to, I can mention many things, but I want to mention one final thing. He talked with us two years ago about the bureaucracy that has engulfed the American people, the small businessman, the farmer, the worker, and he promised us that he would do something about it. But before he could really make, to really accomplish much in this area, he had to bring about needed, badly needed civil service reform, something that no other president had been able to do in a half a century. It has now passed both the House and the Senate, and for all practical purposes has been accomplished, and again, our president has kept his promise. Right. Now, my friends, the president has been able to do these things and so many more that we could name because he has had the support of Democrats like Lamar Gudger in the House of Representatives. And I want to report to you that Lamar has been a stalwart there. He's accomplished mu as much in two years as almost any congressman I know. Now we need to give him additional Democratic help in the Senate by electing John Ingram. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the distinct pleasures of serving as a master of ceremonies is the opportunity it gives one to present his friend. And it is a particular pleasure to me to introduce to you the platform guests whom I will ask to stand as they are recognized. First, I would like to present the man who distinguished himself for 20 years as Commissioner of Agriculture in Texas, now the Chairman of the National Democratic Party, the Honorable John White. Right. And next to him, our beloved Chairman of the North Carolina Democratic Party, Betty McCain. And seated next to Big John Ingram, his lovely wife, Mrs. Ingram. And to my far left and next to Senator Morgan, my own beloved Jeannie. Governor Hunt will be speaking later on the program. I will not ask him to stand now. But behind him is Bill Hefner, my colleague, congressman from the 8th District of North Carolina. And be beside him, governor, former Governor Bob Scott, now chairman of the outstanding and very important Appalachian Regional Commission. And next to Bob, Mayor Trantham of our city, and next to him, Mayor Todd of the city of Hendersonville. They have greeted us upon our arrival here. In earlier comments, we have intimated the tremendous achievements of the President of the United States in international affairs. I remind my friends and colleagues, however, that the strong leadership of the Carter administration has not been limited to international affairs. With the wide eyes of a beginner in Congress, I watched the flow from the date of the inauguration of messages to the Congress from the White House telling us what President Carter knew this country needed to move ahead. First, there was the bill to grant the president emergency power to bring natural gas from the west to us in the east. Then the economic stimulus package. Then the request for presidential authority to reorganize the federal government. Then the Department of Energy Act. Then the National Energy Policy Act itself. Then the request for hospital cost containment. Then a new plan for welfare. Then a proposal for civil service reform. I am aware that Congress has not granted everything asked, that many of the President's proposals have been modified and revised, such as the Tax Reform Act, the National Energy Act, but certainly everyone on this platform is aware that the President has fulfilled the promise he made in Columbus, Ohio in October 1976 to provide leadership to the nation, a policy, a program, a plan, 
there, too, he used a Bible verse to remind us, and I quote, If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? Mr. President, your trumpet has been sounding loud and clear and certain. We congratulate you upon your commitment to attain a balanced budget, to maintain a strong national defense, and upon your success in overcoming unemployment and putting five million Americans back to work. We are reminded, Mr. President, that about 40 years ago, another strong leader, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, came to Western North Carolina in his first administration when America was beginning to go back to work and to regain its status of leadership among the nations of the earth. He learned to like us, and he came back to see us in his second administration. We certainly hope that you will do likewise and that you will be coming back again and again to see us over the next six years. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a high privilege, a deep honor, to present to you the President of the United States. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Senator Bob Morgan, Governor Jim Hunt, former Governor Bob Scott, my good friend, Congressman Lamar Gudger, Congressman Hefner, and Congressman Mann, Mayor Trantham, Mayor Todd, Chairman White, Chairman McKean, many people in the audience who are responsible for my being president, who share with me the successes and the blame. I'm glad to be back home in North Carolina. <laughs> Even if I am one week late, It's partially your credit that we finally ended the Camp David summit with success because I was eager to come back to North Carolina and I wasn't the only one who was eager to leave. <laughs> the last day when everything seemed to be going wrong, Prime Minister Begin came up to me and said, Mr. President, I promise that Israel will get out of the Sinai if you'll let me get out of Camp David. <laughs> It's a good time for all of us. In politics and government, in a person's private life, there are times of struggle, times of disappointment, times of challenge, times of failure, times of hope and times of dreams, times of success and notable achievement, times of prayer and times of thanksgiving. And I have felt throughout the last 20 months, and particularly the last two or three weeks, that your prayers were indeed with me. We have a great country. It's always a mistake for us to overemphasize the transient or rapidly changing problems that we face. Our country has always been willing to face great challenges and to overcome difficulties and to meet difficult challenges and to answer tough questions. We've not changed. We still have the same pioneer spirit that bound us together 200 years ago or even earlier. My people, the Carter family, moved from North Carolina longer than 200 years ago. And we've always had a kinship with your state and a realization that there was a role for the individual human being in a democratic free society that could contribute 
no matter whether one had a service station or a peanut farm or was occupying the White House, we are party to a team effort and a team spirit that's not going to stop, not going to pause. We're going to continue to make our nation and to keep our nation the greatest one on earth. You can depend on that if I can depend on you. I'm particularly glad to come here with Lamar Gudger. Although he is new in Congress, he's no newer than I am in the White House. And I have felt particularly close to him. I looked at a clipping from a local newspaper not too long ago. And it said that although I had very good support from the North Carolina congressional delegation, that the best support from any congressman in Washington from North Carolina was from your friend and my friend, Lamar Gudger. I thank him. I thank him and I thank you for sending him there. And I have to make one request of you. When November comes, I want you to send him back with one of the biggest margins of any Democratic candidate in the whole United States. He has helped me on things that are important to you. Along, I have to admit, with other people on this platform, Bob Scott and the other members of Congress. When I went into the White House, we had a very serious series of problems. As a farmer, as a warehouseman, as someone who's lived in agriculture all my life, I know how bad the farm depression was 20 months ago, 24 months ago. Those of you who are interested in agriculture think back. Prices were going down that the farmers got for our products. Prices that they paid for fertilizer, seed, equipment were going up much more rapidly. Net farm income was dropping. Last year, October the 1st, on my birthday, we put into effect a brand new agriculture bill. And since then, farmers' spirits, farmers' well-being have been going up. This is a great stride forward. Another problem that I had when I became president was a high unemployment rate that Bob Morgan mentioned. When I became president, there were 10 million Americans who could not find a full-time job. More than 7 million Americans did not have a job at all. The unemployment rate had been going up steadily almost for the preceding eight years. And the Congress and I formed a partnership to try to do something about it. Since that time, we've had a net increase of over 6 million new jobs in the United States. The unemployment rate has dropped two full percentage points nationwide. And it's holding steady and progressing in the direction that you wanted to move. This could not have been done without cooperation. And one of the best things about our programs that we put forward is that we've done it not depending just on government handouts and jobs. They've been important for some special groups. But we've tried to strengthen the private enterprise system to let private jobs, permanent jobs, be the root of the progress we have made, and that's what we're going to do in the future. I've always been concerned about the government bureaucracy. I talked about it a lot during the campaign. It's one of the reasons I was elected president. I thought it was bad, but when I got to Washington, it was a lot worse than I thought it was. <laughs> and we've done something about it. Early last year, the Congress gave me the authority to reorganize the structure of government. And we put forward a series of reorganization plans. There's not been a single one refused by the Congress. This is an extraordinary, unprecedented achievement. In the past, Democratic and Republican presidents have only been successful in having the Congress approve about one out of three of the proposals made. But it shows the harmony that does exist between a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president answering the demands of the American people. For the first time in almost 100 years, we now have civil service reform on the verge of being passed, thanks to many of you. 
who've let your members of Congress know how important it is to you. We've got, a, we've got hundreds of thousands of competent, dedicated public servants who work under the civil service system. They want to do a better job. They want to see excellence and dedicated rewarded, so employees rewarded. They don't want to see someone sitting next to them loafing and incompetent, promoted and paid at the same rate. So what this new law will do is to let us reward good employees, correct the defects among those that are not very good, inspire them to work harder or fire them if they don't work, and let managers manage the government, save you money, give you better services. Everybody wins all the way around. I just want to mention one other thing since I'm in North Carolina and know how you feel. My professional career, as you know, was in the Navy. I was a submarine officer and I went to the U.S. Naval Academy. And I believe in a strong defense. And as long as I and these men are serving you in Washington, we're going to have a strong defense, one so strong that no one will dare to attack us with any thought that they might be successful. You can depend on that. But there's another element of defense, and that is strength through character. We don't need to be a bully trying to push other people around. We don't need to be combative with a chip on our shoulder at all times. And since I've been in the White House, we have tried to reach out to others, even some of those who have not been quite so friendly with us in the past. We put our arms around the shoulders of our close friends who might be living next to one another in a state of war. And we've said, let's talk about the problems of our people and bring peace to the world. Sometimes this has been very unpopular, even with some of you. One of the most difficult decisions that I've ever had to make in politics was to deal with the Panamanian treaty question. Some of you didn't like what we did, I realize that. But we now have a new spirit in Latin America, a strong, friendly spirit of mutual respect. Not a great nation or a big brother looking down on others, but one which we formed a partnership to strengthen those ties of friendship, democratic principles, a preservation of human rights. And with that strength, we can keep out the spread of communism in our own hemisphere. We've tried to deal fairly with the Turks and the Greeks to bring peace to Cyprus and to restore the damage that had been done to NATO. And lately we've reached out to our friends, the Egyptians, and our friends, the Israelis, to bring them for the first time in 30 years after four wars to a state of peace and friendship with open borders and trade and an end to the terrible bloodshed that's wreaked havoc in that area. So there is a combination of strong, staunch military commitment on the one hand and a nation that's clean and decent and a source of pride on the other hand, where people can respect us and where we, the true spirit of our country can be shown to the rest of the world. And as long as I'm in the White House, I'll continue to exemplify what you are, what our nation has been what our nation has been in the long past, what our nation is now, what it can be in the future. I believe in those spirit commitments that were made 200 years ago here in your state and mine, and I believe that you want us to raise a banner high of protecting human rights around the world as we do in our own country, and that's what we're going to have if you'll continue to be partners with us. I don't want to look too far away from you. We've also recognized that the best government is the one closest to you. I don't believe in a big brother in Washington telling you how to run your business. We've tried to get government's nose out of people's business as best we can, but not in a combative or disputive way. We formed a good alliance with the mayors here on the platform 
with the airport manager here, where we stand, with Governor Hunt and many others. And it's very important that we continue this. We're trying to make North Carolina a kind of rural laboratory to show that small towns and cities like where I live and people who live on farms have a chance for a better life. Right here where we're standing, even though you've already gotten some help from the Federal Aviation Administration, I can announce today there'll be $2 million more coming in here next month to add 1,500 more feet to your runway, giving you an 8,000-foot runway to connect you with the outside world. And we've tried to do away with some crazy federal regulations. In one day early this year, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, eliminated 1,100 regulations. We're trying to do the same thing in the Farm Home Administration. I grew up in an area where there's a lot of oak wood and hickory wood that can't be used for much else except burning. And there's been a regulation that even in a farmhouse, you couldn't have a farm home administration loan to put a fireplace in the living room. But we're taking that regulation out to let folks around here that have trees keep warm in the winter and not spend a lot of money on buying fuel that's produced in Oklahoma and Texas. We had another regulation that said when you build a house, you had to provide money for curbs and gutters. But where I grew up in the country, we didn't need curbs and gutters. And we are removing that regulation as well. There's another one that says you couldn't get a farm home administration loan if the grade level in a particular area was more than 15%. There are a lot of places around this site we're standing, Asheville, where 15% grade looks like flat land. So we're making changes like this to make your life better. I might say, in closing, that I need your help. We've had some successes. We've got some challenges ahead. I'm very grateful to you to come out and meet me today. I ask you to help politically as well. I realize there are a lot of Democrats here. I realize there are a lot of Republicans. There are a lot of people that don't have any party affiliation. But I hope you'll give your careful attention to electing John Ingram to the U.S. Senate and Lamar Gudger to the Congress to give the kind of spirit that I try to exemplify in my own political life, a deep care about people who need help most, who want to stand on their own feet, make their own decisions, arrange their own lives, be proud of their own government, work closely with the local government, respect the officials, respect one another, live in a nation that's strong and peaceful. Those are the kind of things I want. They're the kind of things you want. Together, you and I, we can have them in our country in the future. Thank you very much. God bless every one of you.